I've got a question. Could you give me a very brief snapshot of what you and Professor Prozen believe is the biological explanation of the human condition? I mean, I, I think I'm reasonably intelligent, so I'd like to quickly see if it's going to make sense to me. Um, you say it can explain me. Well, go ahead. Tell me about me. Fair, fair enough. Um, and, and I agree. What is to be, to be presented is first principle-based, um, rational, testable, biological understanding of the human condition. So that there's no um, dogma or, or faith or belief or mysticism or superstition or any abstract concepts involved in the explanation. So say you're on safe ground. The explanation is all about knowledge that either stacks up or, or it doesn't. And, and if it doesn't, you should throw it over your shoulder, reject it. What I have to explain will either make sense to you, in fact, makes, in fact, make sense of you, because this explanation explains human behaviour, or it won't. Um, so I'll, I'll begin with an analogy. What would happen if we were to make, uh, take a, a migrating stork and put on his head a fully conscious mind such as we humans have? We, we choose a stork because we want a big bird to carry this big brain. We'll call him Adam Stork because this story is like the, the biblical account of um, Adam and Eve, but with a very important difference. Now, when we first come across Adam Stork, he's following his migratory uh, instinctive flight path up the coast of Africa to the rooftops in, uh, in Europe for his summer breeding season. We can see the nest up there on, on the top of the house. Now, um, disregard the rest of this. We'll come back to this in a moment. However, with his newly acquired, fully conscious mind, Adam Stork is now different. For the first time, he is able to think for himself. And so he starts thinking. He sees an island off to his left, we can imagine, and thinks, well, well I'll, I think I'll fly down there for a rest. Why not? And so he does. He deviates from his migratory flight path and flies down towards the island. But what's going to happen? When he does this, isn't Adam Stork's instinctive self, which is orientated to a migratory flight path that doesn't include the island, going to try to pull him back on course? We can see here Adam's instinctive self saying to his conscious self, that's his Adam Stork's instinctive self here, saying to his conscious self, here, fly back on course, come back. You can see that, come back on course. Again, disregard this part of the the diagram will come back to come to that in a moment. Well, we can imagine that not wanting to upset his instinctive self, Adam's conscious thinking self would decide to abandon his experiments in self-adjustment and choose not to not to go down to the island. He, he, he'd give in to his instincts. However, flying on, Adam Stork sees another island we can imagine with some apples on it, and he thinks. Why not fly down there for a feed? And again, his instinctive self resists this, this experiment in self-management. Now, this puts Adam in a dilemma. If he continues to obey his instinctive self and never carry out experiments in self-management, he'll never learn to master his conscious mind. It's only by experimenting in, in, in self-management um, that Adam Stork will ever learn to understand the difference between right and wrong decisions. So the basic problem is instincts are only orientations, they're not understandings. I mean, over the course of thousands of generations and migratory movements, only those storks that happened to have a genetic makeup that inclined them to follow the right route survived. Thus, through natural selection, storks acquired their perfect instinctive orientation to where to fly and where not to fly. However, when the, the nerve-based learning system uh, gave rise to, to consciousness and the ability to understand the relationship between cause and effect, it, it wasn't enough to be orientated to the world. The conscious thinking mind had to find understanding to operate effectively and, and fulfil its great potential to manage events. So, if, if Adam Stork obeys his instinctive self and flies back on course, he'll remain perfectly orientated, it's true, but he'll never learn if his deviation was the right decision or not. I mean, all, all the messages he's receiving from, from within himself tell him that obeying his instinct is good, is right, 
But there's also now an inclination to disobey, a defiance of instinct. Deviating um, from his course will result in apples and understanding. Yet, yet he, he can already see that doing so is going to make him feel bad. But the problem is, sooner or later, Adam Stork must find the courage to master his conscious mind. So, not knowing any reason why he shouldn't fly down to, to the apples, he, he does persevere with his experiment in self-management and, and, and heads down towards the island. But again, his decision is met with criticism from his instinctive self, which he now has to live with if he's going to continue these experiments. <clears throat> so immediately he's condemned to a state of upset. A battle has broken out between his instinctive self, which is perfectly orientated to the flight path, and his emerging conscious mind, which needs to understand why that, path, that flight path was the correct course to follow. Now, Adam Stork obviously had to do something to resist the unjust criticism that he was having to endure from his instinctive self. I mean, it would be impossibly unbearable to have to just accept the criticism when he rightly feels it's not deserved. But without the ability to explain himself, what, what could he do? I suggest all he could do was retaliate against the criticism, try to prove it wrong, or simply ignore it. And he did all of those things. If you go back to the diagram, Adam became angry towards the criticism. You can see his angry expression here. The, the criticism here from his instinctive self. He became angry towards that criticism. And in every way he could, he tried to demonstrate his worth, prove that he was good and not bad. You can see his fist clenched here. Yes, see, I'll prove to you I'm good and not bad. And thirdly, he, 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 he tried to block out the criticism. You see his hand blocking out the criticism. So he became angry, egocentric, and alienated, or in a word, upset. So Adam Stork became angry, egocentric, and alienated as the only three responses available to him to cope with the injustice of his situation. And, and only when he could find the explanation of his upset condition, the explanation that has just been given here, that, that, that science is at last made possible, which is the difference between the gene-based instinctive orientating system and the nerve-based conscious understanding system, could Adam Stork hope to relieve this, his, his situation? So suffering upset was the price of his heroic search for understanding. It was the inevitable outcome in the transition from an instinct control state to an intellect control state as it was for, for humans, because we, we were the ones who developed the fully conscious thinking mind. Um, the the so-called seven deadly sins uh, of, the, of the human condition, of what are they? Lust, anger, pride, uh, envy, covetedness, um, gluttony, how am I going, sloth. Um, uh, they're, in truth, all different manifestations of the three fundamental upsets of anger, egocentricity and alienation that unavoidably emerged when humans became fully conscious and, and had to set out in search of knowledge in, in the presence of unjustly condemning instincts. Now, uh, this, this analogy is similar to the story of, of the Garden of Eden, except that in that presentation, when, as it, as it says in Genesis in the Bible, Adam and Eve took the fruit from the tree of knowledge, that is, they went in search of understanding. <clears throat> they were, as Genesis says, banished from the garden, thrown out of the garden of Eden, uh, of our original innocent state, for having become bad or evil. However, in this presentation, Adam and Eve are revealed to be the heroes, not the villains they've, be, they've for so long been portrayed as. So... While we are immensely upset, that is immensely angry, egocentric and alienated, we humans are good and not bad after all. And, and we can see that as soon as we are able to explain that we are actually good and not bad, all the upset, all the angry, egocentricity and alienation that resulted from not being able to explain our upset condition subsides, it disappears. Finding understanding of the human condition is what liberates and transforms us from our upset, angry, egocentric, and alienated, alienated condition. 
So that was a very brief description of the liberating and transforming explanation that will be uh, presented in more detail later in this presentation. What it reveals is that we humans are nothing less than the, uh, the heroes of the story of life on Earth. Now, I, I say this because our fully conscious mind is surely nature's greatest invention. And to have had to endure the torture of being so unjustly condemned as evil for so long, I mean, we humans have been fully conscious for some two million years, must surely make us the absolute heroes of the story of life on Earth. And, and doesn't the feeling exist in you and in all humans that far from being banishment-deserving evil blights on this planet, we are immense heroes? When we humans defiantly shook our fist at the heavens and said, one day, one day, we humans are going to establish that we're good and not bad after all. That was demonstration of belief that we were ultimately good and not bad. And doesn't this explanation at last make sense of that, of, of your and everyone else's immensely courageous and defiant attitude? And doesn't this explanation validate a core feeling in you that that you're not a meaningless wretch, but in fact an immense hero. In fact, doesn't this explanation bring deep, bone-draining relief to the whole of your being? It's precisely this explanation's ability to at last make sense of human life, of all our behaviour, that lets us know that we have finally found the true explanation of the human condition. Albert Einstein <coughs> said, um, truth is what stands the test of experience. And since this explanation is about us, our behaviour, we're in a position to personally experience its validity, to know if it's true or not. 